Although things are tough for everyone right about now, there's a case to be made that this is just the tip of the iceberg for some of the struggles that commercial real estate investors might see throughout the rest of the year and even into 2021. But with doom and gloom all over the news right now, that doesn't mean there isn't opportunity out there. And in this video, we're gonna talk about one of the product types I like the most right now, especially during the economic times we're seeing today. So if you're looking to buy a real estate deal this year and don't know where to look, or you're trying to break into the industry as a real estate investment professional in 2020, this video will break down where I see one of the biggest potential opportunities today in the real estate investment space. Hey, this is Justin from BreakingTheCRE.com, and if you're new here on this channel, we talk about real estate investing careers and real estate financial analysis. So if you're looking to break into the industry or do your first real estate investment deal, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any new videos as soon as they're released. So real estate investors primarily target what are often referred to as the four major food groups, office, industrial, retail, and multifamily. But over the past decade, another type of residential real estate, single family rental homes, have entered the conversation and have started to see an increased interest specifically from institutional capital, especially those with the technological platforms that can support the management of fragmented housing portfolios. In fact, between 2011 and 2017, private equity groups, hedge funds, and other institutional investors spent a combined $36 billion to acquire over 200,000 homes across the US. And at the same time, between 2007 and 2017, the US renter population exploded with less than 1 million additional owner-occupied homes created in that time versus 6.5 million renter-occupied homes added in that same 10-year period. Major private equity firms became players in this space with Blackstone, Cerberus, and Colony Capital each creating subsidiaries aimed at acquiring single-family housing product. And JP Morgan also just announced a new joint venture with American Homes for Rent, the second largest single-family homeowner in the US with over 52,000 units under management. The partnership plans to deploy at least $625 million of capital to develop 2,500 units across the Western and Southwestern United States. So with so much institutional capital pouring into the space in recent years, what are the fundamentals that are driving those investments and why are single family homes more attractive than ever today? Well, first let's start with the fundamentals that existed prior to 2020 and the economic events occurring today. Earlier this year, the Urban Land Institute released a research report titled Family Renter Housing, a response to the changing growth dynamics of the next decade. And in that report, they defined a family renter household as a household with children living at home. And these households make up one third of the entire rental pool in the US today. And with kids generally comes the increased need for more space and traditional multifamily housing just isn't fitting the bill in the last decade. In fact, with the increased trends to develop micro units and affordable urban product, the average size of multifamily new housing units in the US decreased from 1,023 square feet in 2007 to just 923 square feet in 2019. And as the millennial generation ages over the next decade, the need for additional space is projected to become even more important as the US Census Bureau projects the number of people between the ages of 30 and 50 to grow 8% from 2020 to 2030, compared to a growth of less than 1% in this age group from 2010 to 2019. And if more millennials start having children and need more space than a traditional apartment unit can provide, and large companies continue the trend towards more permanent work from home arrangements, this could perpetuate the trend of millennials moving out of large expensive cities such as San Francisco and New York and moving to less expensive, more suburban areas in search of a larger home and more space to raise a family. In fact, in a new research report by the rental platform Zumper that aggregates rental data from over 1 million active listings, the company found that rents for one bedroom units in San Francisco dropped by 9.2% year over year between 2019 and 2020, which is the largest decrease that Zumper's research has ever reported. New York City, Boston, and San Jose round out the top four most expensive rental markets in the country, and the data also showed that these year-over-year one-bedroom rental rates decreased in these markets as well. And decreasing rents without significant increases in supply is indicative of decreased demand, and with current events leading to more remote work opportunities, this could very likely be a tipping point in the shift of millennials into suburbia today. However, even if millennials are committed to leaving expensive cities and living in single family homes, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll be able to buy their dream home right away. 
and many millennials are currently priced out of owning homes due to the massive housing boom the U.S. has seen over the last decade. And across the entire U.S., the average home sale price has increased from just above $250,000 in 2010 to over $375,000 in 2019, representing a compound annual growth rate of over 4.6% per year during that period. And at the same time, late last week, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics released data that the unemployment rate was 13.3% in May, creating additional difficulty for many would-be millennial homeowners to enter the housing market. Add that to tighter lending standards on single-family homes, a desire to be out of densely populated areas, and the ability to work from anywhere, and you could potentially have millions of Americans looking to move into a single-family home in the suburbs over the next few years who will be entering the single-family rental space by necessity. And speaking of remote work, single family homes also provide a greater opportunity for home office space than a traditional multifamily apartment unit does. New data from Zillow found that two thirds of employees that are currently working from home on a temporary basis would be at least somewhat likely to move if they had the option to work remotely full time. And within the group that considered moving, 31% said they would want to move in order to live in a home with a dedicated office space, and 29% said that their goal would be to live in a home with more rooms. So with a clear trend towards continued increased demand in single family rental product, what does that mean for real estate investors and how can real estate investors capitalize on the opportunities that might arise over the next decade if and when this shift occurs? Well, first, it's important to note that in most markets today, single family home investors need to be focused on long term value growth and appreciation rather than maximizing cash on cash returns right out of the gate. And that's because right now, the vast majority of US markets don't have single family home rents that are going to produce noteworthy cash on cash returns, and many will actually produce negative cash flow at traditional 60% to 80% LTV ratios. And to use San Diego, California as an example, according to Zillow research data, the average home price in San Diego in April of 2020 was just over $664,000, while average rents in San Diego during that same time period were $2,306 per month. And to run some quick math on that, property taxes on a $664,000 house in the city of San Diego at a little over a 1.23% property tax rate would run you roughly $8,200 per year in property taxes and about $1,200 per year in insurance for a total of $9,400 per year in expenses, assuming you manage the property yourself and the tenant was 100% responsible for all maintenance associated with the home. And assuming no vacancy at all, this $2,306 per month of rent would produce an annual net operating income of roughly $18,300. And using an all cash purchase of a $664,000 home, that would produce only a 2.76% cash on cash return, again, assuming no major capital items had to be addressed during the year. And if you did put debt on the property, even at a 3.25% interest rate, using today's rock bottom rates, a 50% LTV ratio would be about as high as you could go before getting into negative cash flow territory. A $332,000 mortgage on the property resulting in annual payments of $17,339 would leave an investor with less than $1,000 of cash flow for the entire year of owning the property or less than a 1% cash on cash return, assuming again there are no unplanned expenses that occur throughout the year. Now with that said, if you're able to have a long-term hold horizon, homes in these cities with low rent to price ratios like San Diego have historically seen strong rental increases and value appreciation over time and could be a good play for wealth growth and preservation for investors that are willing and able to hold for the long term. And for San Diego specifically, the city has experienced compound annual rent growth of almost 4.4% since 2014 and compound annual property value growth of almost 5.1% since 1996, according to Zillow research data. And for investors that are looking to go more of the cash flow route right out of the gate, lower price cities are going to be the best option to achieve that, but even traditionally lower price cities in the Midwest that saw single family home pricing in the early 2010s that produced strong cash flow for buyers have been bid up by investors looking for yield over the last decade. Kansas City, Missouri, for example, saw single family home prices at $210,000 in April of 2020, with rents at just $1,069 per month, resulting in approximately $13,000 a year in rental income before taking into account expenses at the property. And assuming property taxes of around $2,500 per year and insurance at around $900 per year, 
that would still only produce about $9,600 per year in net operating income on a $210,000 purchase, which would produce just a 4.6% cash on cash return without leverage. Again, assuming you self-manage the property and there are no additional capital expenses on the property throughout the year. So if you don't wanna wait for appreciation in a market and you don't wanna head out of state in search for what is currently very little yield, what else can you do if you want to enter the single family rental space? Well, investors that don't wanna get their hands dirty and invest directly in single family homes can also leverage the platforms of these big players in the market that we talked about earlier on in the video, specifically by investing in publicly traded REIT stock. The biggest players in the space like Invitation Homes and American Homes for Rent are publicly traded companies and can offer dividend yields and potential value increases over time without all the heavy lifting necessary by doing it all yourself. Now, dividend yields on these companies have been relatively weak, similar to the do-it-yourself methods that we talked about earlier on in this video. And obviously, I'm not recommending any stock picks, but as single-family home investing becomes more and more prevalent, this space is likely to continue to grow and the options to invest in single-family rental homes, aside from outright property ownership, will likely increase as a result. Now, if you do wanna do this yourself and you wanna dig deeper into the analysis behind the underwriting and valuation of single family rental property acquisitions and how to run market research using free tools like we talked about in this video in the process, make sure to check out my course, The Complete Guide to Analyzing Single Family Rental Houses, and I'll link that in the description below. And as always, if you want access to all break in a CRE courses, all models, and some additional one-on-one -on -one support, make sure to check out break in a CRE Academy, and I'll link that in the description below as well. Also make sure to leave a comment on this video and let me know any other niche product types that you have your eye on today outside of the four major food groups of multifamily, office, retail, and industrial. So I hope you found this helpful. If you like this video and wanna see more content like this, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any new videos as soon as they're released. Thanks so much for watching as always, and I will see you in the next video.